I'm certainly not saying this of all the student protesters that are out there, and certainly not uh, children of Palestinian uh, families uh, who have lost loved ones um, through the years in, in this war, in this conflict. Um, I will say, though, among, again, and I've spoken with some of them, I want to be careful, but among these white, woke, pampered, uh, elitist, I'm not supposed to use that word, let's say children from wealthy families that decide, as Dr. Brzezinski said so many years ago, that they're, they're going to play radical for a weekend and then go home to mommy and daddy's mansion. Um, there's a complete ignorance about the complexities of this issue. Now, of course, if you listen to this show, you would understand many of the complexities of this issue because we have been really tough on Israeli officials that come on this show. We have asked why they've continued to allow illegal settlements in the West Bank over the decade, why they have continued to fight against a two-state solution for peace, why they have done what they've done in Gaza, why they did with Hamas, uh, why Netanyahu is Hamas's ally uh, leading up to October the 7th. So it's very complicated. That's lost, though. And a lot of those things. And when you start talking about even West Bank settlements with a lot of these students, their eyes glaze over. They, because that's not in the TikTok video. And again, I'm not saying this about all the students, but I will tell you, I'm saying about a hell of a lot of students I have spoken with. When you go, well, you know, in 2000, there was an Oslo Accord where Bill Clinton had gotten together and they were giving 97 percent of the West Bank to the Palestinians and the other three percent they were going to make up with Israeli land. And they had figured out a, you know, a, a, a capital in East Jerusalem. And they sit there with their eyes glazed mm -hmm. because they have no idea what happened in this peace process, what happened through the years. They just they see something on TikTok and they're like, Israel bad and Hamas good. And they go out and they start shouting at Jews. Yeah, and so, you, don't even have, you don't even have to go that yeah. deep. You can ask, what does it mean to chant from the river to the sea? And they don't know. And then when you tell them what it is, and we've seen this from reporters asking some of them, not, again, not all of them, some of them have a deep understanding of this. They don't understand that that means the elimination of the state of Israel and the people who live within that state. So I've been having a lot of these same conversations as you, Joe. So if you watch our show, you know how critical we've been of Netanyahu, of the prosecution of the war that we <coughs> grieve and mourn for children and women who have been killed in this war, that are starving in this war. It's a terrible, terrible thing. But that does not give kids on college campuses license to chant from the river to the sea and to say that Jewish kids should not exist in some cases, uh, at Columbia, for example. So Jonathan, um, from your point of view at the ADL, what are you hearing? I mean, we, you've, you've brought yeah. us a great look at the Jewish experience since October 7th, but right now, in the midst of these protests, what is it like to be a Jewish student on the campus of not just Columbia, but University of Texas, there are a whole bunch of schools. It's the right question, Willie. You know, I was at UCLA on <clears throat> Sunday. I was at USC on Friday talking to Jewish students. I was at Columbia last week. And let me tell you, I don't know exactly what Eugene saw at GW in terms of these tents, but I've talked to students from all these universities and they don't feel afraid. They are with good reason. Right. And you, I mean, as mentioned in the opening here, you had someone with a hatchet at University of Utah. You had students with hammers who broke into the, uh, the building at Columbia last night. You had someone with a sword at UCLA on Sunday. This isn't normal. People showing up fully concealing their faces like they're ISIS fighters. That isn't normal. And I heard from kids again and again and again. They are leaving campus. They are moving out of their dorms because they are worried at Columbia, of course, President Shafiq, mm -hmm. she had to close classes. I don't know if people realize this. Classes are over at Columbia. They all went remote because the administration was so afraid of these people. I see these videos. I see these images of mass protesters breaking into buildings, barricading them with furniture. And look, I'm reminded of January the 6th. That's what this looks like to me. I mean, we talk at ADL about right-wing extremists. 
about masked proud boys showing up at school board meetings, about oath keepers wearing masks. I look at this and I, this is what I see. And let's be clear about right. one thing. The students who are doing this, the groups behind it, SJP, Palestinian Youth Movement, their response to President Shafiq's offer last night was, we, Columbia will burn. I mean, these students, we shouldn't mm -hmm. treat them like children when they're hardened activists. No, well, they're adults, and yeah. go ahead. No, go, uh, so, <clears throat> I was just going to say this is uh, you know, it's one half about the students. It's also about, Mika, these authorities and the lack of yeah. them. Okay. What? Why, is, why are these school administrators, why are they abdicating their responsibility to this degree? Uh, and this affects students, it affects outsiders, it affects teachers with tenure. The last I checked, tenure is supposed to give you intellectual protection so you can say things in classrooms. Uh, it doesn't, it seems to me, give you the ability to break the law with, with impunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't yeah. understand what, what's... And you see also the difference on the campuses between what's happening on some, Chicago and Florida, as opposed to what's happening at, at Columbia and others. There's an enormous gap in the, in the right. principle and backbone we're seeing here. Well, Richard, to your point, I think that's where we've all... That's the place we've all been sitting in watching this, going, what, what the hell is going on? What are these universities doing? Why aren't they doing something? And I'll echo the horror um, uh, that this does look like January 6th. What a terrible example for our students. Um, at the same time, these are young adults. And the question is, why do you choose to learn about the complexities of other situations around the world? But this one, you want to set up an encampment. This one, you want to scare people. This one, you want to come to the edge of violence or even go to violence. Not, not the this edge. one, They're you risk your future and your education for. See, I think these college students obviously are missing the part where they need to see what's going on across the country with these protests that it's now in the realm of violence, it's in the realm of hatred, whether some are peaceful or not. They need to watch the news and look at all the different arguments and be adults or start learning to be adults and set up discussions and debates across college campuses or their colleges or universities are going to have no choice but to expel them and ruin their future, the impact they want to have on the community, society, and the world at some point. But let's then go to the hard part of this. What is the solution for college university uh, presidents and deans who want to maintain control but also preserve free speech on the what is well, what are it, solutions it's, it's, let's it's, talk it's, about it's, solutions it's very simple you first of all you enforce the rules of of your college campuses there is a concept well, but you know that at this there point would be that would be would hard be, to do well not, so. no no actually what well, you, i'm just you, saying you, you go either, out there and you, you start arresting people the law. yeah you do you either follow the law you okay. don't follow the law there's a there's a concept yeah. in, i don't think it's in, that in simple. the first amendment uh, no, if, if, if you, I will say, I understand over the last 24 hours what the Columbia administration has been trying to do. They've been trying to bring this to a peaceful resolution. And what happened? People got hammers and they broke into buildings. At that point, that's a crime. At that point, that's a crime. They should all be arrested and they shouldn't be suspended. They should be expelled from school. Here, here. Uh, but, but, but this is virtue signaling of the worst order for, 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 again, white, woke kids that have no idea what they're talking about here, no idea other than what they've seen on TikTok. Again, there's a, a huge gulf, in my mind, between children of Palestinian families who have, who have been a part of this uh, tragedy and this suffering over the decades. And so uh, I, I am not one to be able to sit in, in judgment of them. Uh, but I can sit in judgment of school administrators. What do you do? What do you do in a situation like this? You stop the law breaking. You make your campus safe for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. You don't allow these protesters to take the campus over themselves and say, this is our viewpoint. We are going to scream. We are going to set up encampments. We are going to dominate this debate so you only hear our side. And the louder we scream, the more self-righteous we feel. That's what they're doing. The idea of colleges, Willie, the last time I checked, uh, for at least when, when there still were liberal, you know, the sort of the liberal tradition of learning, 
at places like Columbia, you actually have discussions. You, you, you actually pursue the truth, uh, not your truth, not the truth you're feeling. You try to pursue the truth, what the truth is. And if you can't get to the truth in a place like Israel, uh, then then um, what, what you do is you talk through it and you try to work towards peace. Uh, you try to work towards a two state solution. Now, people say, and I've heard this from students on college campuses. Oh, you can't even bring up a two state solution because they say they say that's a Zionist conspiracy. Peace for the Palestinians is a Zionist conspiracy. Go take these pictures down. I want to talk to Willie. Willie, who's learning? Who's learning by the, these images that we saw? Who's learning more about the Middle East? Who's learning about the illegal settlements on the West Bank set up by Netanyahu? Who's talked through a discussion with, let's say, Jewish students to say, you understand your government's been illegally setting up settlements in the West Bank, making a two-state solution next to impossible while cynically aligning with Hamas? Because you, you want to undermine the people who don't want to wipe Israel off the map because they're the biggest threat to a two-state solution. And if you get both sides talking together, you would find out that Hamas and Netanyahu both are enemies of a two-state solution. So maybe that's why they were working together to divide people in Israel to divide people in Gaza, to divide people in the West Bank, and to divide people on college campuses. And then you ask the question, okay, so we understand there are people who are enemies of peace here. What do we do to outthink them? What do we do to outmaneuver them? How do we move toward peace? Because that's what this should all be about, not virtue signaling or screaming or breaking into buildings. But for that to happen, People that run universities can't allow anarchists to take over buildings, to use hammers to break into buildings. Now, people say, oh, you can't. Do yeah, you, you can enforce the law. Hmm. You can enforce the law, and then you can start classes again, and then you can begin teaching students, like having discussions with students, talking about the horrific, horrific complexities that, that have surrounded this argument, this debate since 1948. And then maybe you learn something. We kind of think that's what colleges are about, not getting hammers and breaking into and occupying buildings at Columbia University. Joe, your analysis is sophisticated, thoughtful, and more than an inch deep, so it's just not going to work, I'm afraid. Won't work. It, it was too point. thoughtful there. But, but I, will, I will say, for all these images we've seen and been discussed and advised, those conversations are happening. Um, I can speak for my own school, Vanderbilt. We had the chancellor on last week. You guys have talked a lot about Dartmouth, where they're having these discussions. They're bringing in an Israeli ambassador and another, somebody the head of the, of the Palestinian Authority, and they're explaining their sides, and they're having a civil debate, and no one has a hammer, and no one's yelling. Right. They're giving people places on campuses to protest. And then, in the case of Vanderbilt anyway, when they stormed into a building and broke a window and pushed a security guard aside and sat there for a day, the students were suspended. They looked individually at all their cases, and they expelled a handful of them. So that's... We've given you all these outlets, Jonathan. We've given yeah. you places to have these conversations, which is what college is supposed to be. You don't have to pick a side. Just listen to the debate. Totally. And it's, but, I mean, do you think any of the people in that building at Columbia right now actually want to have that conversation? Look, President Shafiq needs to, you know, deliver consequences, not make concessions. Chancellor Deermeyer at Vandy is an example of just a leader with moral clarity. That's your alma mater. My alma mater is Northwestern. President Michael Schill actually gave, gave in to the protesters 
yesterday at Northwest, Northwestern inexplicably literally making a series of concessions to them after they did the same thing. And I think we need to keep in mind, these demonstrators are ruining it for everyone. They are holding hostage kids' graduation, commencements, just the final exams period. So it's not just a Jewish problem, it's everyone's problem. And, 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 and Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan, these kids that are going to miss their college graduation yes. because of, of these these people that these these people that are occupying buildings and yeah. making the campus unsafe were the same ones that missed their high school graduations yep. because of COVID. Again, the selfishness, I just it's it's extraordinary that that they they have to shut down campuses when in fact there are ways for them to get their message across. Of course there are. And keep in mind the numbers. The numbers. Columbia has 30,000 students. You know how many are in this encampment, Joe? It's like 200. So we're talking about seven-tenths of one percent. Same kind of numbers at Northwestern or all these schools. This is a fringe between literally like six tenths and one percent of all of the students and I, I would say one other point that's really important you know not all Jews look like me there are plenty of Jews from the Middle East at USC on Friday I heard from an Iranian Jewish student whose parents fled the Islamic Revolution who's basically been told you can't be part of the Middle East North African group because you're Jewish he is more from the Middle East than many, if not most, of these people. He grew up hearing Farsi in his home as his first language. But you know what? To these kids, because he's Jewish, you know, he's not part of the crowd. That is racism, plain and simple. And so, look, much like you were talking about, about Hamas earlier, yep. and I'm sure Richard will talk about it in a bit, Israel keeps offering them concessions, making offers on hostages, and they refuse. And these demonstrators, these activists, they get offered concessions by the universities. And look at what's happening at Columbia right there. They simply refuse to accept That's because awesome. it seems like their goal isn't to come to some conclusion. It's about no. what's better for the Palestinians. It's just to reject Israel, to reject their Jewish peers. Again, that's racism and it's wrong. Well, and, and Jonathan O'Meara, there was a Columbia student that was quoted, and that was UCLA, I believe. There's a Columbia student that mm. was quoted in the New York Times yesterday who said, I support a ceasefire. I, re I really wanted to go in, and I wanted to, I, I wanted to be with the people that were protesting for a ceasefire. But basically, it wasn't about a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. It was about the end of Israel. And because I support Israel, they told me, the existence of Israel, not what Israel is doing, the very existence of Israel, because I supported the existence of Israel as a Jew, but because as a Jew, I also supported peace and a ceasefire and the end of the war in Gaza. They told me that because I was I, I, I didn't want Israel to be eliminated from the face of the earth, I was not allowed to be part of their protests. Yeah, we had Mayor Eric Adams in New York City on yesterday who said it was a mix of student protesters as well as outside agitators. And he was clear to say most of the students peaceful. They were there on campus. It's the outside agitators who were causing most of the trouble in hurling the uh, violent rhetoric. And we're not sure who yet has occupied this building, Hamilton Hall, the main academic building in Columbia. It's also the site of the major Vietnam War protests of the 1960s. We should also note Columbia University uh, has put out an alert this morning telling uh, students and personnel to stay off campus uh, this, today because of what's happening there uh, at Hamilton. And certainly there's a peace, place for peaceful protests. There shouldn't be any, any anti-Semitism, any anti-Semitism. But Jonathan, Muslim Jonathan this is your college. Jonathan, who allows this? Who allows students to take over a bill? I mean, again, this is not, I tell you, this happened at Vanderbilt or University of Alabama. It would be over. It would be at Alabama, my God, it'd be over in five minutes. Like, who allows students to, to break in illegally into buildings and occupied buildings? Yeah. 
Well, I, we, I mean, Colombia does is we should know. Colombia is proud of its history of protests. Uh, you know, the, the, that's part of who Colombia is. That said, of course, it seems like the administration has made clear this has crossed any no number, to any sell number of keep lines. kids away from Colombia. You, <laughs> this you're is, saying look, it's it's part of Colombia's <clears throat> storied history to allow people to go in and peacefully. illegally to break peacefully. into buildings. To oh, protest. Oh no, 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 no! They're proud of illegally breaking into Joe, buildings and taking over fortresses. presidents' offices in the 1960s, and you would think if that hung over them for 50 years, they, they would have been better prepared than, than this well, time. And certainly they were not. And students and alumni and parents alike are upset as to how this has been handled. And certainly they're moving, they hope to move to a quick resolution. We don't know yet whether the NYPD might be involved or not. Mayor Adams yesterday has said Columbia had not asked for that. Uh, we will see if that changes in the hours ahead. It's obviously a developing story. Now, um, Richard, I do want to get to you what uh, Jonathan just brought up a minute ago, which is the ongoing state of these hostage negotiations. We heard of Secretary of State Blinken was in Saudi Arabia yesterday. He said Israel had made a generous offer um, that we're just simply waiting on Hamas. Also, U.S. officials tell me they feel like there's a very narrow window here to get something done. There's concern that Hamas, frankly, just doesn't have that many hostages left to give back, at least those that meet the criteria of this deal. Um, and also, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his, his aides keep saying a Rafa invasion is coming. Uh, the U.S. wants to get this deal done before that. No, those are exactly the pieces, Jonathan. You've got a two-phase negotiation that's being uh, discussed, a hostage for prisoner exchange in phase one, then so a limited but unclear how long duration pause, and certainly in major military operations, possibly a complete uh, ceasefire. But yes, the Israelis uh, still want to uh, move against uh, Rafah, where you have uh, the preponderance of uh, Hamas fighters, as well as probably half the Gazan uh, population. The administration is trying to work this, this hostage for prisoner swap, get it ceasefire. If they can't, the fallback of the administration is saying, OK, we don't particularly want you to go into Rafah, but if you're going to go in, do it in a measured, calibrated way. Use force in a much more discriminating way than you've used for the preponderance of the last six, seven months. So there, there, there's lots of uh, negotiations going on uh, with Hamas, with Israel, almost on various uh, contingencies. That's where we stand. And my guess is this will become clear in the, in the next couple of days. You know, here we are essentially coming up at the seven-month point. Uh, of this. But let me say one last thing. However this works itself out over the next couple of days and weeks, you're still going to have some of the same fundamental questions. Yeah. Who's going to govern Gaza? Uh, who's going to occupy it? What about the Palestinians on, on, on the West Bank? Where do we go from here? Is there a political dimension to Israeli policy? Joe was talking about settlements a minute ago. What about settler violence? What about Israel's uh, willingness to stop expro expropriating land? Are the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, willing and able to step up uh, to be a partner for peace? So all of these issues are going to come back once we see what happens over the next few days. All right. Uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, to close, I just want to uh, start where we began, which is on the campus of Columbia University. You have students, you have outside agitators, and you have a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about. So within the realm of that, what should Columbia do? If you could tell them right now how to handle this, what's the solution? I would say President Shafiq. Like, listen to the people around you, not to the radical fringe. President Shafiq, number one, none of us support the use of excessive force, but coordinate with law enforcement and get those protesters out of those buildings and retake the campus for all your students once and for all, number one. Number two, no concessions to terrorists. These kids are telling you they, quote, want to burn Columbia down, like Chancellor Deermeyer, who Willie mentioned before suspend and expel the kids who are trying to destroy the institution. And number three, President Shafiq, no masking on campus. Kids who conceal their identities, as Jonathan said, many of them are outside agitators, professional protesters. They are going in there and they are destroying Columbia University for the, you know, to the detriment of everyone. Your Jewish students need you. All your students need you. The broader Columbia community needs you. So President Shafiq, Again, get in the law enforcement, consequences, not concessions, and no more masking, whether it's KKK or Proud Boys or SJP. 
CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt. Jonathan, thanks for being here this morning. Thanks. And guys, as we head to break here, just a quick statement last night from the University of Florida, which says it patiently allowed students to protest for many days, warned them that eventually uh, they'd be trespassing. They arrested a handful of students and sent out this statement, quote, this is not complicated. The University of Florida is not a daycare, and we do not treat protesters like children. They knew the rules, they broke the rules, and now they will face the consequences. Here, here. That's from the there University of Florida. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Still a little while ago, I had the honor of calling Senator Barack Obama to congratulate him. Please. I urge all Americans. I urge all Americans who supported me to join me in not just congratulating him, but offering our next president our goodwill and earnest effort to find ways to come together, to find the necessary compromises to bridge our differences and help restore our prosperity, defend our security in a dangerous world, and leave our children and grandchildren a stronger, better country than we inherited. Whatever our differences, we are fellow Americans, and please believe me when I say no association has ever meant more to me than that. That was the late Senator John McCain during his concession speech after the 2008 presidential election. That was just over 15 years ago, but those calls for bipartisanship, civility, and hope seemed far removed from today's toxic political climate and active threats to democracy. Joining us now, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and columnist for The Washington Post, Bob Kagan. He's author of the new book on sale today entitled Rebellion, How Anti-Liberalism is Tearing America Apart Again. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Um, Let's start with the term anti-liberalism, if we may. Can you please define it? Yeah, I mean, the word liberal is thrown around. Uh, it has a lot of meanings for, for a lot of different people. But, but what, uh, the, the, the essential thing about our founding it was that it was, a, it was a liberal government in the sense that it was about protecting individual rights for all people, universal equal rights for all people. And that was what the government was founded on. And we have been... Uh, that that system has been under attack at various different times throughout our history uh before the civil war obviously the south was opposed uh to that to the declaration of independence and even today uh in fact coming back uh today these forces have returned uh that are opposed not just to the biden administration but to the general regime they call it the regime uh that is the founders uh system and this is not just a Donald Trump problem. Some of his core supporters are committed to changing the system that we've been living under and undermining our democracy. And we need to understand that if Donald Trump wins, it won't just be the danger posed by Donald Trump, but by many people in his administration and by his, his strongest supporters who simply do not believe in the fundamental principles on which this government was founded. And you write in the book, Bob, on the other hand, if he loses in November, he undoubtedly will call into question the outcome of the election, the results. We've seen this movie before, of course, four years ago. And then you, you sort of follow the dominoes even further from there, which is to say Republican-led states may change the way they work with or do not work with the federal government and view their own role in our culture, our society. Yeah, for one thing, we, we kind of forget that, that the secession or the threat of secession was a very common feature uh, of American government, certainly in the 19th century until the Civil War. It, it is always an option. And I think what we need to understand is that if Donald Trump loses, as I hope he does, and he declares that the election is fraudulent, this time he's going to have the Republican Party substantially supporting him. You'll see the leaders in both houses 
agree that the election was fraudulent because they're totally, uh, you know, supportive of whatever Trump says. And then the question is, what happens in heavily Republican states, uh, states where the legislature is Republican, where the governor is Republican? We've already seen Texas uh, recently, in a way, engaging in a nullification by having its own or trying to establish its own border control, which is which is, you know, not the way things are supposed to work. That is. And, you know, if you poll America. Americans, quite amazingly, a very high number in both parties uh, talk about the possibility of secession if the wrong president, uh, if the wrong person is elected president. So I do think that is something to worry about. The one thing that I think we can all be confident of is that if Trump loses, there will be a substantial uh, resistance, perhaps violence. Uh, you know, January 6th on a much on a much greater level, and I think mm. we won't be out of the woods even if Trump uh, loses. So, Bob, we have always had tremendous issues boiling in this country forever, no matter what decade you're talking about, no matter what generation. But today, if you listen to the principal candidate for the Republican nomination for the presidency, he describes at times a country that to me is unrecognizable, a country that seems almost finished, a country that if he's not elected, it's over for this country. Uh, a country that if uh, the election goes to Joe Biden this fall, it'll be the last free election we ever have. What has happened within the confines of all of that I just described to change, so drastically change the way we look at the country? Well, I think what, what's happened is that the Republican Party has been captured by this fundamentally anti-liberal movement. It's a minority of the country. In fact, it's a shrinking minority of the country uh, insofar as it's made up primarily of white nationalists and white Christian nationalists uh, who are a shrinking portion of the country, but who have uh, a significant influence clearly in the Republican Party and can control uh, what everybody else does. and and. And that has given Trump license. And in fact, he has summoned this group to him. You know, uh, we talked about, we were talking about John McCain's concession speech to Barack Obama, his gracious speech. How did Donald Trump introduce himself to the political scene in this country in 2011, potentially for a 2012 run? He made his number one issue, uh, uh, the birther conspiracy. In other words, that the first black American president was not really an American. Every, it's clear what he was doing when he when he did that. He was saying he was signaling, "I am the candidate of white nationalism. I am." And, and now he's made himself the candidate of white Christian nationalism. You know, with the Trump Bible mm -hmm. and saying that he's going to teach America to pray again. This is from Donald Trump, of course. But he has that following, and so I think what we're seeing is not necessarily a fundamental uh, a misdirection of the United States, but a particular group that has always existed in this country has now seized control of one of our two political parties, and we are now paying the price for that. And by the way, one of Donald Trump's first acts as a candidate was to attack John McCain and his heroism during his time in Vietnam. The new book is an eye-opener. It's titled Rebellion, How Anti-Liberalism is Tearing America Apart Again. Bob Kagan, thanks. Congrats on the book. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Hunter Biden is our top story this hour. Willie. Yeah, that was a $787 million judgment against Fox from Dominion just one year ago. And now lawyers for Hunter Biden say they are planning to sue Fox News imminently over unfounded claims made about Hunter Biden on the air. In a letter sent to the network last week, obtained by NBC News, Biden's attorneys notified Fox of the impending lawsuit. They write, it arises from the network's, quote, subsequent actions to defame Mr. Biden. The letter focuses heavily on a six-part mm -hmm. special that aired on Fox's streaming service in 2021. In it, the network presented a mock trial for what it might look like if Hunter Biden were charged with being a foreign agent or with bribery, neither of which he's been charged with. Biden's lawyers also say they plan to sue over Fox's decision to show nude photos of Hunter on the air, which he says were stolen. Fox has not responded to a request for comment. So what kind of case do you see wow. here potentially for Hunter Biden against Fox News, Joyce? Well, what the core of the charges they're alleging uh, would look like would be a defamation lawsuit with maybe some subsidiary torts like presenting Hunter Biden in a false light. You know, Willie, we've all watched our country be locked in this battle with disinformation. 
And it looks increasingly like defamation lawsuits are one of the most important tools in the arsenal for pushing back. Um, before you can file a lawsuit for defamation, as a plaintiff, you have to demand a retraction. You have to give the potential defendant the opportunity to say that they were wrong. And so Hunter Biden is asking Fox to retract. And the question is whether Fox will have the appetite to fight another lengthy, costly, expensive battle. They've already lost, as you pointed out, uh, in the Dominion voting machine case. And they're facing a $2.7 billion lawsuit from Smartmatic later this year. You know, uh, former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, uh, thank you so much for your insight this morning. Joining us now, MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle, NBC News and MSNBC political analyst, former U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill. She and Jen Bon Mary are co-hosts of the MSNBC podcast, How to Win 2024, and co-founder and CEO of Axios, Jim Vandehei. His new book, entitled Just the Good Stuff, is out today. We'll get to that in just a moment. So on the Hunter Biden issue, do you think Fox will have, because I, I think they're demanding that Sean Hannity, Jesse Waters, Maria Bartiromo and others apologize. Do you think they'll they'll do that? Or do you think they're going to once again go double down, double down and possibly face a pretty large verdict? Because you look at what's happened in the Republican committee, and they've just spread one lie after another lie after another lie about Hunter Biden, and it's blown up in their face politically. You know, I think that um, Fox lawyers will have to look at what exactly they're accusing them of and whether it, it merits defamation. And also, as, as it pertains to the nude photos of Hunter mm -hmm. Biden when he was going through a drug addiction and other very difficult mental health challenges in his life, something that he's written about in his book and he owns and admits to. I guess revenge porn is now uh, a thing that can hold up in court. Better to go to Claire McCaskill about this, who may know more in terms of the law. But it seems to me that Fox News has a decision to make. Um, but I'll just say on a human level, when you put a person in a position where they have nothing left to lose, where you humiliate them to the point where they're like, you know what, you keep lying about me. Now you're putting these pictures out of it. You're enjoying this. It's time. It, it, you get to the point then you have someone who is willing to go to the mat. And that's where it looks like Hunter, Hunter Biden is headed. Claire, your thoughts. Well, I, I think it's smart for Hunter Biden to ask for a retraction. Uh, it's a complicated legal issue because they have to determine whether Hunter Biden is a public figure. Uh, there's a different set of rules for people that are public figures versus strictly private citizens. And it's more difficult. A defamation case is much more difficult if you're a public figure. But I will say this. I, I will say this is all part of a problem that Trump has really added to. We were all shocked listening to the testimony, reading the testimony of David Pecker when he actually talked in very plain and simple terms about how the National Enquirer buried stories, how mm -hmm. they paid people for stories that they then decided not to report, or how they were part of a political operation to smear political opponents. And we were all shocked at that because even though everybody kind of knew it about the National Enquirer, it was hard to hear it out loud if you are part of a news organization that takes their responsibility seriously. But people need to understand that Trump has convinced about half the country that this is what all journalism is, that every outlet of journalism is made up, that it's all about trying to help somebody or hurt somebody, not reporting the facts. So this mm -hmm. is really what Trump has done. And Fox has been under that umbrella now for a long time, even though it cost them close to a billion dollars. So it's going to be very interesting to see whether they do the business prudent thing, which is to say, hey, we went too far and got it wrong, or whether they decide to open the checkbook again, if for nothing else, a very expensive legal proceeding. So it's interesting, Jim Vandehei, I mean, fair to say that um, on issues pertaining to very important national conversations on January 6th um, and on Trump's criminal, the charges mm -hmm. against him, 
and on Hunter Biden. Now, Fox News has sort of, among other uh, right wing, but they're the ones in question right now, given this potential lawsuit, has really pushed the envelope. I'll say that kindly. I'll say that really kindly. Yep. But out and out lied about Hunter Biden, have said that January 6th was nothing. Se several of their hosts say out loud that it was, it was nothing, nothing to be worried about. Other hosts get away with it by just avoiding. They don't talk about, they don't cover, they don't put anything in context. And that's its own sort of irresponsible choice. But here's about the law. What was your reaction to the news that Hunter Biden is suing Fox News? Your gut reaction, like does Hunter Biden, and now is he just punching back? Or does it seem like some of the other defamation suits we've covered recently, like it has legs? Uh, at least we've done a lot of reporting on Hunter Biden, and he's been very clear that he's uh, that he's wanted to fight back. He's often under a lot of pressure from the White House and people in the campaign uh, not to. They don't want him to be uh, the, the the focal point of the campaign. But he feels like, listen, like he's getting maligned. He feels like he has a case. Uh, he wants to fight that case, and now he's going to fight that case. And what the senator said is the thing I think so much about uh, and that, that we've all lived through, which is I just hate the fact that so many people are losing all faith in the media and in truth because of these constant, relentless, uh, baseless attacks. Like most people in the media are trying to get to the closest approximation of the truth. We are not perfect. But you better be careful out there. The minute that you have right. nothing that nobody trusts, it's very hard to govern. It's very hard to have society uh, function. And, uh, and I think that needs to end, and it probably won't. So, Mike, what do you hmm. think about that, this idea of lack of, of faith in, in, in the media? That, that, you know, from certainly we know it, this is the voices on both sides, both political parties, but certainly from the right. Donald Trump has been doing this for years. He is the overwhelming uh, loudest voice here. Republicans have claimed for a long time the mainstream media, but he's taken it to a new place. He's deemed reporters the enemies of the people, dangerous stuff, and a number of, of us have all received threats because of it. Is this something that, that we can ever get back, or is this now... Is this, is this a lost cause, or, or is the media always going to be viewed with such skepticism and, frankly, outright disgust? That I don't know. I don't know the answer to those two questions, Jonathan. What I do know is that Donald Trump was very ineffective. He was incompetent at governing. Okay, but what he was not incompetent at was branding the press, fake news, all of that. And it is stuck. It yeah. has stuck. A lot of people have not as much faith in the media as they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. We're talking about the Hunter Biden case. Everything, it seems, in this country goes to court almost immediately, and we get tied up in legalisms. I'm telling you, the average person who, take the average person that all of us know, anyone who leads an average normal life, show them the last six or seven years of clips on Fox News about Hunter Biden, you'd throw out the legalisms, you'd say, oh, this is clearly an effort to destroy this guy's life to destroy a human yeah. being, using the power yeah. of television to destroy a human being. So now he's going to take it to court, apparently, finally. But the news media, the news media's reputation, partially our fault. We've lost, you know, <laughs> when I got into the business, Jimmy, when you got into the business, I don't know whether there was the same instructions given to you as was given to me. Mm -hmm. People like to read about people. Yeah. They don't like to read about smears. They don't like to get upset over their cornflakes at 7 o'clock in the morning. But they like the news and they like to read about people. We have lost a lot of that impetus. More than 50 U.S. mayors are in Washington this week to discuss efforts to combat homelessness at the federal level. Joining us now, Democratic Mayor Karen Bass of Los Angeles. She's the chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayor's Task Force on Homelessness and Republican Mayor David Holt of Oklahoma City. So, uh, Mayor Bass, uh, let me begin with you. Thank you all both so much for being with us. You know, uh, sure. I, over the past few years, I've, I've, I've spoken with the mayors of major cities, mainly across the Northeast, but some of the West Coast. And ask, why can't you take care of the homelessness problem? Why does it keep spreading? And they always would allude to these lower court rulings that didn't give them the authority to take care of the homeless crisis in their own towns. It looks like the Supreme Court is going to give that power back to the mayors, back to local officials to take to have a holistic approach, the way that works best in their own communities. Is that good news for you? 
Oh, well, I don't think that it's helpful, frankly. Um, it's not just a matter of what tools you need to move people off the street. It's about getting people housed. And so my concern about what the Supreme Court can do is that it could essentially usher in a wave of people being ticketed like they were in the city, $200, $300 tickets for being on the street. What does that solve? We need to get people housed off the street into housing. And one thing that we've certainly been able to do in L.A. is, it, is to see people are not refusing to be housed. They don't want to be on the street. And so I think giving cities the power to arrest people or to ticket people does not solve the problem. Well, it doesn't solve the problem, Mayor Holt, but is it at least a good first step uh, for you to be able to have more control of your situation? Well, as a general rule, of course, mayors want local control. But as Mayor Bass said, I mean, you are not going to arrest or incarcerate or ticket your way out of a homelessness issue. And that's mm -hmm. that's one of the toughest things to accept when you deal with this very intractable problem is you've got to bring wraparound services. People have come into homelessness a thousand different ways. You kind of have right. to have a thousand different options to get them out of it. So I would say it's it's a lot more complicated than that because, you know, it's easy to clear an encampment and move people on. But if you're not getting them into housing and then getting them the support, you know, the, the, the job training, the substance abuse, the mental health services that they need, they're, they're not going to stay off the street. Mayor Bass, uh, Los Angeles has had a long running problem with homelessness and people on right. the street at Skid Row right. and, and elsewhere. So this certainly didn't start with your administration, but you're in the hot seat now. What sort of measurable progress uh, have you made, can you make uh, in the foreseeable future uh, to get people off the street and to get them housed? Well, uh, first of all, we absolutely have to have a comprehensive solution because we can get people off the street and then more come on the street. But we have to develop a system of long-term interim housing while we are building, and we're doing exactly that. So I've signed executive directives that uh, fast-track building. You know, Los Angeles over the years has become extremely expensive to live in, so we have to address the supply of housing. We have to have a place for people to go while housing is being built and the wraparound services that Mayor Holt talked about. If we do not address this in a comprehensive manner, we're not going to succeed. And just to be clear, in Los Angeles, we're talking about in the city, we're talking about 46,000 people who are unhoused. And so we can make a measurable difference, but we have to operate from several different perspectives. And that's why we're here in D.C. right now. We're trying to address a problem with veterans being unhoused. Veterans should not have to choose between their benefits and housing. So that's the specific issue that over 40 mayors are here addressing on the Hill today. Mayor Holt, good morning. As you know, and you mentioned, so much of this gets back to mental health and, and mental illness of people on the streets and circumstances that have brought him there. So how do you get better than we are now at the root cause of homelessness, or at least one of the most prominent? Right. And, and I should give a lot of credit to the organization that Mayor Bass and I are a part of, because that's a high point of emphasis this year, in addition to homelessness, is mental health. I mean, we just have to invest in it at every level. You know, what, what caused a lot of what we see today, it's not the only cause, but, you know, 50, 60 years ago, this country made a, a decision for all the right reasons to kind of close the institutions. The problem was that really wasn't replaced with anything. And so today, the streets and our jails and prisons have really replaced what was once the mental health institutions of this country. Local level, state level, federal level, everybody's got to make new investments in this issue. And you're right. I mean, it's not the only thing. There's, Like I said, there's a thousand different ways that people enter uh, homelessness, but mental health is obviously a major contributor. And we as a society just have not invested in that enough. We have to do more. Appreciate both of your focus on this issue. Mayor Bass, before we let you go, I want to ask you about the scenes we're seeing and we were just discussing at the top of our show at both UCLA and USC, these campus protests over the war in Gaza. How do you think the schools have handled them? Well, I think the schools have hand, both schools have handled them the best that they can. But I will tell you that right now, both U USC and UCLA are peaceful. I know that the administration is talking to the protesters and trying to come to a peaceful resolution. So I feel good that we will get there. All right. Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass and Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt, thank you both very much for coming on this morning. 
Some breaking news just in in the Trump hush money trial. Moments ago, Judge Juan Mershon ruled Donald Trump violated his gag order nine times. Trump fined $1,000 per violation. Joining us now outside the courthouse in lower Manhattan, NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, what more can you tell us? Hey, Willie, we're just making our way through the order that was just issued by Judge Marchand. This was first brought to the district by the district attorney's office to Judge Marchand, alleging that Donald Trump was, should be held in contempt for violating 10 different times the gag order that was placed on him, prohibiting him from attacking potential witnesses as part of this criminal proceeding, as well as the jury. And what Judge Marchand has decided is that nine of the 10 instances from social media Media posts of Donald Trump, he did in fact violate the gag order and is held in contempt. Charge one thousand or find one thousand dollars for each of those posts. He says in part that this was a willful violation by Donald Trump, and he noted that several of these instances were reposts on his true social account. And Donald Trump's attorney Todd Blanche had suggested that that did not in fact mean that Donald Trump was the one making the statement. But as part of this order, Judge Bershon said that whether he had any extra commentary or not, a repost does uh, violate violate this gag order because it is a form of speech by the defendant, Donald Trump himself. Along with those $1,000 fines, Donald Trump has been ordered to remove each of those nine posts on his social media account by the end of the day. And there was also an amended order, an amended gag uh, uh, order on Donald Trump that now also includes uh, other counsel to the district attorney. So Donald Trump could attack Alvin Bragg if he so desired, but he is not able to personally attack others. We have seen him go on the offensive against particularly Matthew Pilangelo, one of the prosecutors here in the DA's office who formerly worked for the Department of Justice. Donald Trump has alleged that he is colluding with the Biden administration by coming here into New York. Of course, there is no evidence of that. It is completely reasonable and not, uh, uh, has, there, it's completely reasonable that an individual leaves one post with the federal government and joins a state uh, entity here. And so for Donald Trump here, now found to have violated the, the gag order nine times, there is an additional hearing we should note on Thursday about other potential violations that the DA's office has brought against Donald Trump. Judge Mershon will hear those potential violations at 9.30 a.m. on Thursday morning. Well, so, so, Jonathan, this was seen by most as a warning shot, effectively, from Judge Mershon. Obviously, the potential for jail time comes way down the road as a last resort. But this was $9,000, obviously, is walking around money for Donald Trump. But it does send the message, we do mean it when we say you can't do and say these things. Right, and now it'll be interesting to watch going forward, this could begin with the, the next hearing on Thursday, whether these the penalties are escalating, whether the, the Trump would face more serious consequences, potentially even uh, a night in jail if he's continued to be held in contempt. Um, Vaughn, uh, give us a sense from inside the courtroom what how this looked, how it felt as it went down, the judge's demeanor, Trump's demeanor, um, you know, a pretty remarkable moment. Yeah, Donald Trump walked into the courtroom there just a few moments ago and uh, looked very, I don't want to assign too much personality to him, but did not look like he was in a particularly pleasant mood here this morning. Uh, he railed against the fact that he's got to be here again, suggesting that he is being removed from the campaign trail, of course. Uh, over the course of those last four days, Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, he had no campaign or no courtroom obligations, uh, but chose not to campaign anyways. It was Melania's birthday. He did fly down to Florida here for the weekend. Uh, but this for Donald Trump is now the third week of this trial, the second week of testimony. It's not clear who the next witnesses are going to be. It could very well be uh, the likes of a Karen McDougal or either a Hope Hicks, Gary Farrow, the former First Republic mm. banker who worked with Michael Cohen to set up those bank accounts there. Uh, he is back on the stand here beginning this morning. Uh, but for Donald Trump, of course, this is only wearing on. And we are looking well into June <clears throat> in which this trial is likely to continue. Um, we're also seeing that the judge has ruled that uh, Donald Trump can go to his son Barron's uh, graduation on May 17th. Vaughn, I'm curious, you might have said it and I missed it, but uh, what else did the judge say about the gag order? I know there's another hearing, but what if he does it again? Were there any warnings moving forward that the consequences could be worse? 
Yeah, actually, I was I just got to that part of the order here at the very end, and I will just read it here for everybody, if I may. Quote, well, $1,000 mm -hmm. may suffice in most instances to protect the dignity of the judicial system, to compel respect for its mandates, and to punish the offender for disobeying a court order. It unfortunately will not achieve the desired result in those instances where the contemnor can easily afford such a fine. In those circumstances, right. it would be preferable if the court could impose a fine more commensurate with the wealth of the, the contemnor. In some cases, that mm. may, might be a $2,500 fine. In other cases, it might be a $150,000 fine. And here's the final line. Because this court is not cloaked with such discretion, it must therefore consider whether in some instances jail may be a necessary punishment. Those are the words of Judge Mershon here on this Tuesday morning, Mika. Okay, well, that's uh, absolutely clear. Thank you very much, Von Hilliard, for that reporting. Um, all right, the uh, criminal trial of Donald Trump in New York City continues, and we'll be back in just a moment with more Morning Joe.